Okay, good evening, everyone. This is Paul Edo Zero T for the Front Range Six Meter Group. And tonight we are honored to have uh, Dr. Scott McIntosh from the National Center of Atmospheric Research uh, give us an update on his latest uh, predictions on cycle 25 and uh, where do we go from here? So with <laughs> no further ado, over to Scott. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks, everyone. And apologies for uh, being kind of tardy and heaving. You have, of course, now my dog decides to start barking. This couldn't get any, you know, what else is going to happen? Armageddon? Maybe. maybe. Uh, all right. So can you see my screen? Yes, sir. Nice. All right. So uh, been a busy week this week, uh, working and talking to a lot of my colleagues about uh about the sun and space weather and all kinds of, of shenanigans. And interestingly enough, there was a session yesterday <laughs> uh, that talked about, are we actually prepared for cycle 25? I was like, that's interesting. You're about a year and a half too late. But um, other than that, um, if you remember the last uh, time I talked to you, um, we were kind of in the doldrums a little bit uh, and we'd had that nice big surge and we were in the doldrums and now uh, I think we're all probably pretty aware that <laughs> things coming back to life again, which wasn't totally unanticipated, but I'll show you um, some of the recent stuff. I don't think, I don't think I need to recap all of this again, right? I don't need to go over all the history again, Paul. I can just jump to the fun stuff, right? Like, you know, like today. Roger that, yeah. Yeah, we actually crossed 200 today, the solar flux. Um, this is the first time since February of 2014, uh, which is kind of on the downside of, of cycle 24. Uh, and allegedly, if you believe the experts, uh, cycle 25 is supposed to be smaller than cycle 24. So uh, there you go, stick that in your pipe. Anyway, so... Um, so I, I don't think I'm going to go over a lot of the history. I mean, if anyone really wants me to go back through all the stuff about EOV bright points and hail cycles and stuff like that, I can absolutely do it. Is there, is there a consensus? It's about half of the stuff. If there's not, I'll jump to where we left off last time uh, and show you kind of what's happened since. Some of it's pretty boring. Uh, well, it's inevitable. I'm involved. It's pretty boring. But other than that, it's uh, there's a bit a lot of action. So, any any sense? Any? I think any we've been following the uh, we've been following the YouTube videos, so I think it, most people understand what's going on. And believe me, I'm not being lazy. It's just a case of you know I don't want to go over I don't, you know beat a dead horse again. Yeah, jump, please. All right, so I'll do it real fast. There we go. Right, watch. Here we go. You pay attention. If you feel up to it, you can stop. You can freeze frame anything. Um, so this is kind of where we were at, right? So um, my team and I have been working on a mechanism to observe the progression of the sun's 22-year magnetic hail cycle. I think the last time I talked to you, I shared with you a... a a little snippet of a paper that we just written, a little sneaky little paper that actually showed that uh, one, of, one of the primary ways that the theorists come after us, because, you know, theorists are devious buggers, right? But one of the ways they come after us is by saying that we're not actually measuring the sun's magnetic field. We're only measuring some um, ad hoc proxy of the sun's magnetic field. Well, you know, we just published a paper that showed, well, we are actually really measuring the byproduct. We're actually seeing signature of the sun's magnetic field. It might not actually be a magnetic variable, but it's absolutely tracking uh, this 22-year uh, magnetic hail cycle. For those of you who've been following along, um, the magnetic hail cycle is the thing that underlies and underpins um, the sunspot cycle. So maybe I can show some of that here. So um, the red, white, and blue thing at the bottom is a kind of cartoon illustration of the progression of the sun's hail cycle. 
you'll notice that there's almost always two hail cycles present on the sun at any one moment in time. The only time when there doesn't appear to be two hail cycles present on the sun at any one moment in time is right now. So we're in the ascending phase of a sunspot cycle. So growth is kind of unchecked. Um, but what that means is that we anticipate to see cycle 26. I know you're all excited and giddy about 25, but you know, uh, we're probably within a year, we'll start to see 26, right? So this is kind of alien, alien warfare concept of solar physics. This is a highly subversive, not in the textbooks kind of stuff. So, um, so there's that. So we've established not that one off. Today, like about three hours ago, I got notification that our paper on the 2021 Terminator event that we were all so eagerly waiting on. Remember that? Um, that was finally accepted for publication. So that's good. So that will now put the put the amended forecast out there officially. Um, and I'll I'll show a bit of that again and also show you where we're at. Um, that was the, the third bullet point there. So the, the death of a hill cycle ends in an event that happens at the sun's equator that then rapidly spreads in longitude and time. I'll come back to that in a wee bit. Um, the After that event, we were left with, you know, you, many of you probably remember the lovely... Um, little linear correlation that we have with um, the separation of sunspot cycles, uh, be their terminator events in the upcoming cycle strength. And that leads us to a sunspot cycle of an amplitude of about 190, just short of 200, plus or minus 20. Um, um, and we'll, you know, kind of take it off from there. I'd put that in bold that you all know that this is not in the textbooks. So, um, you can imagine the amount of flight that we take. It's considerable. It's probably why I spend a lot of my time watching World War II documentaries. So anyway, what I would do for a P-51 to hang out with me. So anyway, so um, here's some of the stuff that we've been looking at. These plots are all updated to December 31st. So they're all very current. Um, for those of you that remember, we were tracking a small kind of ubiquitous feature on the sun called an EUV bright point. These things are a few hundred thousand kilometers across. Sound uh, in the scale of the sun, that's tiny. On the scale of the Earth, that's fucking huge. Uh, but these things are ubiquitous. They, uh, they appear to be connected to the sun's um, deep convection pattern. So just like our, our our atmosphere has a convective pattern, it's hard to that's hard to see other than the clouds. Um, the sun has a convective pattern that shows itself in um, little cells and granules and things, and, and these markers um, persist um, through the granular or through the through the cellular pattern. So we found a way to characterize those back in the early two thousands. Um, and we've been tracking them ever since. So it's coming up on 20 years. Makes me feel really old. I'm 48. I can't, as I really, was it, I, I, my mind's blown a little bit. Just, I just blew my own mind there. So uh, that I've been doing that that long. Um, one of the things we were waiting for uh, is the signature that you see in this plot um, up above. We dubbed these things the Terminator back in, 2015, we we noticed that there was a very abrupt change in uh, the production, the sun's production of these events as a function of latitude and time. So a few things you'll note here if you look at this. So this is an image of, of density of these features per degree on the sun per unit time, so per day, all right? So this is a scale goes between zero and five. Zero is black, five is bright red. Uh, and a few things you'll notice that happened at the very end of 2021. One, that the number density of these objects goes to, you know, it goes to less than 0.5 very rapidly. Um, but also, if you look at the latitudinal pattern, what happens up at, you know, um, 
45, 50 degrees, well, what happens at the equator? And then at the middle latitudes, the, the opposite happens. So there's a, a drop in density at high latitudes in both hemispheres, a massive drop in intensity at the equator, but the two mid hemispheres light up. So basically that what we interpreted this to be is that the last tail cycle dies at the sun's equator. And that means that the next one can grow like a uh, banshee at mid latitudes. We do not know what's going on at higher latitudes. But the whole point of our premise here was to demonstrate to our peers that when this shift happens at the equator, it's global in nature, right? And it happens on such an astonishing timescale, right? This change in the sun's magnetic field happens in the timescale of a few rotations, so a few months. And for an object the size of the sun, that's uh, kind of mind-blowing for a lot of the theorists. Um, out there, and this is why some of the stuff is a bit of a challenge. As I pan out in time a little bit, so here's the the, the spacecraft that um, back in the day when I was just a wee whippersnapper, I was involved in the science definition team for this this mission. I was the coffee boy, believe it or not. So uh, all these big shots would be talking about these instrumentation, and I was kind of farting around in the back of the room trying to you know, figure out what was going on and what they were talking about. Well, this is the end product of some of that work from about 20 odd years ago. And you can see much clearer now the definition of the event that happened because a whole year has passed, right? So you, when you put it in a decadal context, you can very clearly see the change in, in what the sun's doing at the equator. You can see also in context with the event that happened in 20. Uh, 2011. So there's a previous event. Then you can see, start to get this idea for the fact that the hail cycles, at least as manifested in these objects, overlap one another, right? So you can see the overlapping. And now it's the five year old. Hold on a second. Yes, Logan. What's wrong? Oh, you just can hang out down here then. Sorry. A little, a little interesting tidbit. So if I go to a longer time scale, so this is now the, not the entire record, but it's the entire record that I've analyzed it goes back to 1996. You can now see three Terminator events. The, there's the bands of cycle 22, 23, 24, and 25 all present in this chart. And you can see the kind of Terminator events at the equator, right? So there's this is not a one-off thing. Um, it's recurrent, uh, and uh, we started to piece it all together that these things were actually important for telling us what the sun was doing. And uh, I think we'll, it's it, it's still something that we're a little bit puzzled by, you know, um, especially the time skills involved. So anyway, um, another look at the death of cycle 24. Here uh, happened in, on, on or around December 13th of 2021, give or take a few days. This plot probably hasn't been updated, but this is just to give you an idea of how these clusters of things morph as a function of time, right? So you can see multi-banded structure. Um, yeah, you can see uh, death. The interesting thing is, you know, remember how earlier I was talking about the fact that you could see them disappearing at the Terminator? Well, in this one, you can see that there's growth, right? So if you look around the mid-2016 time frame, you see that all of a sudden stuff starts to populate at the mid and high latitudes. And um, some of that is cycle 25, and some of that we don't know. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that my colleagues and I are interested in is a mission to go and observe the sun's poles so that we can we can actually um, try and quantify what's going on up there. It's uh, is, uh, unexplored territory. For those of you that have been following along, um, one of the other points we like to stress, and I'll hopefully show it a wee bit clearer in the next slide or two, is that this is not a latitudinal, not only a latitudinal effect, but it's a longitudinal one. 
and we use a kind of standard meteorological trick um, to do that. So if I um, take the middle of these three plots here, uh, so there's one in the southern activity band, one in the northern activity band, and one right at the sun's equator. And so um, what each slice in time, so these are daily, each slice in time is a ring around the sun at the equator for the middle one, right? And then the left one and the right one it is positioned across the middle of where the sun's activity belts are. So this is just a snapshot. For those of you who remember, we had the false dawn, the false dawn of the 2020 election. So in November, literally at the time of the uh, November election in 2020, um, it looked like this transition was happening and then it fizzled out. It got about three quarters of the way around the sun and it just died. Just reverted back. And then it happened again about a year later. And so that's something I'll I'll talk about in a wee bit a wee bit later is this idea of um <clears throat> periodicities in the system. So um I won't get into this a little bit. This is really um trying to explain that that um that longitudinal coverage was really stifling us for a while. And and those of you that have been been with this since the start will remember that the um, we had a phase where not all the longitudes were active and there was large blocks of the sun. So large swaths of, of, of various meridians were not active. And, and we seem to have really kick that into the touch uh, in recent events. So um, here's, the, here's the, the version that I showed you of that plot back in September, okay? So you can quite clearly see the effect of the Terminator at the equator, right? This is not hijinks, jiggery pokery or anything. Um, the thing to really pay attention to in the left and right panels is do you see how these things are slanted, right? So these, these are actually propagating patterns. So they're actually waves. So the sun's magnetic field isn't stationary at given longitudes. It actually travels slightly faster than the surface. Right, because there's, Nessie doesn't live at the surface of the sun; it lives down at some depth that we don't quite understand. And so, when we see the sunspots, they're actually not rotating at the same speed as the surface. And so, when you make plots like this, um, if they were moving at the same speed as the surface, they'd be vertical, right? But the fact that they're slanted tells you that they're actually anchored um, somewhere else. So you can see that they roughly have the same uh, angle and you can see that there's clusters or trains of sunspots that follow the same trajectory. I don't know, I don't, you probably can't see my, my cursor here where maybe I can try to bring that up. But if you use your mind's eye and look at the right-hand plot and you'll see um, a pattern that starts at about minus 160 degrees, you can draw a diagonal line back at about 45 degrees to that. And you can see that that's a wave train. So there's there's recurrent magnetic activity on that same pathway um, over the course of about 18 months. So the sun also has a long residual memory. There's the difference between um, September and January. I know it's so exciting, huh? Right? So um, not a lot of big changes, but you what you'll start to see now are in the north and the south, the latitudes have started to, to fill in, right? So now, oh, sorry, the longitudes. So where we were in September, you know, if I go back, the south, if you remember, had a few active regions that were about 30 to 40 degrees separated in, in longitude, but they weren't beefy ones. And in the north, we had one longitude that kept coming back around like a lighthouse. Look at the picture now. So in the Southern Hemisphere, you, as of this week, you have six active longitudes. And in the North, you had four or five. So things have really... <clears throat> no, it never ends. I'll come up and get it in a minute. All right? So things have really changed. I hope you like the, the family life aspect. Did you, did you change the slide? 
Sorry? Did you change the slide? Oh, now it now it's your new slide. It was just stuck. That was just me. <clears throat> so if you remember, one of the things that we talked about before all of this stuff happened was what would happen to some of the things that we normally associate with solar activity. So here is the response of the cosmic ray flux. So the, the, the bath of relativistic particles that the Earth is bathed in. No, so if you magically inflate the sun's magnetic field, you will magically deflect a whole bunch of cosmic rays. And so for your, for your own benefit, you can draw where December 2021 is in that plot. And then you see that the, the amount of cosmic rays drops by about 10% over the next six months. Okay. So there's, this is a real thing and it affects the whole solar system, right? Um, here's, um, I kind of zoomed in, look at that. So it's kind of more warts and all, but you can see the 10% drop over, you know, things are pretty much ticking along until the end of December and then, okay. So as the sun's magnetic field starts to inflate like a big umbrella, the amount of cosmic rays that can penetrate that actually goes down. So um, that's actually good. That's a good thing. This isn't a bad thing. Um, and we'll get into, you know, one of the things I was worried about when we did this presentation last time was how the hemispheres vary. And also the fact that the, the different, the variation in the longitudes so there would be places where we wouldn't have a lot of activity at certain longitudes, but there'd be residual activity at the equator. So if you want to take a second and look at this plot, you can see that um, in the middle of the doldrums in October, the sunspot number dropped dramatically. Everybody was getting a wee bit panicky then. And you can see that there's a, a lot of residual activity in the, at the equator between August and October. We don't know what that was. We know that it wasn't cycle 24, but we're also not entirely sure um, what it was. So, but, you know, ever since then, uh, things have got dramatically better. So here's the solar radio flux over the same time scale. It's very easy to see the descent, the mid-December 2021 jump. Um, we had a couple of false dawns before that, as I talked about earlier. We had, a, we had a nice steady increase up until about June. And then we entered the doldrums that we were talking about the last time um, we talked. And then look at the growth since then. That growth is kind of continued, but of course it's wobbly. But, you know, I think we're it's safe to say we're on a, a pretty safe track. One of the other things, um, if you remember these slides, was I want you to pay attention now to how the scale changes on these plots. So if you remember, we're talking about longitude here. So this takes the sun on average about 28 days to rotate. And we were seeing, you know, this is from February of last year. What we were looking for was when would that blue line cross 100? Okay, so the blue line is the average for the month. Uh, the red line is the projected sunspot number. The green line is the past rotation. So there's the version. So scale change. See the scale change? So it goes that one's from 0 to 120. This one's from 0 to 180. Um, it's all uh, relative. But we were still seeing the same residual pattern of active and unactive longitudes. Right, so it was like, but it was kind of a little bit funnier than that because the two hemispheres were also, so where the north was active, the south was not active and vice versa. So the front side was active and the north, the back side was quiet. And so there's, this is a truly global problem. Um, here's the most recent data. So this, when did I pull this? Um, looks like the 11th, so yesterday. So look at the scale change again, okay? So we're now very firmly on the raise. Go back, look at where the troughs are, right? So the dips here in the data are sitting at about 20 sunspots. And that 
they're looking at about 50. Here, you're now sitting around 100. So that the whole pedestal of activity is starting to creep up, right? Um, one of the curious things, uh, and I won't get into this in a lot of detail, but it was the fact that the, the sun is only just starting to manifest um, the behavior that we saw back in, uh, in the early parts of cycle 23 and 24. So can you see those big surges? So these waves that are in the data? So that's the sun has this kind of 11 month periodicity where the, the hemispheres become more or less active. It's pretty cool. It, it, it's similar to a meteorolo meteorological system on the Earth, right? So, um, but so far this cycle, it hasn't really done that. The growth, as you can see um, over here, has been fairly uniform in the two hemispheres, even though they're asymmetric. So what that probably means is that even though the North has concentrated into just a few longitudes, when you average over a whole rotation, like this is, it's about the same between the north and the south. So and you can see maybe the hint of a wiggle um, in the northern data here in red, uh, and, and clearly the south is going to start turning up. So when we look at this data in February, clearly the south is going to start ticking up. And so we might have a synchronization between these two um, hemispheres wobbling away. So, uh, again, if you recall, the 2021 Terminator meant that um, our original estimate of cycle 25, which was somewhere between about 240, 230, uh, 260 spots, was revised, revised downward to be about 190 plus or minus 20 with fairly significant um, confidence. That's just a wee bit, um, it's kind of around the historical average. But if you compare to the, the magenta data here, it's uh, still almost a factor of two higher than uh, that forecast by my peers. Uh, and really the thing that's got us in a lot of trouble. I see Frank. Hey, Frank. So um, I don't know if you've been lurking at the bottom of my screen forever, but uh nice to nice to see you man uh and so where where does it what does this mean okay so this is a beautiful chart i mean we literally jumped to our seats when we saw this chart the first time right um but it means something uh, and and if if cycle 25 does fall close to that green dot it means that probably a lot of the things that we understood about how the sun's magnetic field works may not be quite right. And remember my earlier slide that said, you know, this isn't in the textbooks. So um, this isn't current. Ah, that is current. So you can see that the this red envelope based on the green dots, I should be more systematic with my colors and, colors and my apologies to any of you that happen to be colorblind but I'm not going to go back and change these, okay? So um, the, the green data, so the daily data and the monthly data are really following that red curve, okay? It's kind of something that I look at on a, on a kind of monthly basis. Um, the blue curve is the peer prediction. So the prediction of my, my peers, um, and we, we just didn't buy it. Two things are wrong with it. Um, the timing is wrong and the amplitude was wrong. And we had a gut, gut feeling about that. And, and literally a few months after that, we published our own results that um, kind of contradicted that work. Here's here's a place where I, I hope you all, if you have the time or the willingness, you pop open a browser and follow this link at the bottom right hand corner here and go to my buddy Chris's website. And he tracks this on a daily basis. So the daily numbers are um, these faint lines. So the green data is that that is official in the books. And the red data is the present uh, measurements. And you'll see that actually the sunspot number is now off the chart. So Chris is going to have to revise the scale of his plots. 
which is great. I don't think we were any of us were convinced that that was going to happen. But now you can see that the sunspot number is uh, trending day by day higher than the blue curves, right? So again, these blue curves are the consensus forecasts. Fun story. Um, the, the, the teal line is the original forecast. Um, the darker blue line is one that they shifted by six months to try and fit the start of the cycle better. Not sure it bought them much. So um, our, our forecast is sitting there in red. So this is the amended one. And the historical average is sitting there in green. So, um, so far, I would say it's looking pretty good. I was a wee bit concerned in the July to September timeframe. You see how it flattened off. And then it's really kicked on a gear and it seems to have gone up a, a further gear um, of recent. You maybe remember this plot from the last time around where we're actually now looking at the timing. We're trying to get a little bit more resolution on the timing of the cycle. And this is a very, very complicated plot. Uh, but basically, um, we're watching the sun's poles close. So when the sun's pole magnetic poles close, the magnetic field goes through a reversal. So actually, the magnetic field uh, goes through a, a complete cycle every 22 years. It's the Heil cycle. And we're waiting on that to happen sometime probably in the next, start happening sometime in the next, I think nine, maybe maybe nine to 15 months, which means that solar maximum is about nine to 15 months away. That is uh, historically happened about the same time. Okay, so we're, we don't have a lot more growth left in cycle 25. But if I go by it to here, it sure as hell isn't going to be, 25, right? This thing has progressed remarkably. And if you look at any UV image of the sun, uh, you'll notice that the, what we call the polar coronal holes are largely gone, which means that the magnetic field has now advanced and is starting the reversal process. So if I uh, you know, play slight mind games with you all, that is the version circa July. That is the version circa this morning when I put it together. So you can see that, you know, it's 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 following a well-appreciated pathway. Um, so we actually, maybe it's safe to say we kind of understand this stuff. I don't know. Maybe, maybe we don't. But the polar coronal holes are closing. That means that Max isn't that far away. So the, the damn thing better get its groove on. Um, here's the plot I made for Frank. So we use the statistical. So this is relevant to you guys. This is the 10.7 the centimeter solar flux. And we thought we would play a game where we thought, well, based on our, our knowledge of the last seven or eight hail cycles, we can look at what the statistical average looks like. And that's that green kind of cloud here, right? That's the statistical average scaled by our forecast sunspot number, okay? So this was it just post Terminator. There it is, middle of the summer. Uh, that is it as of Friday. So it dropped below for the things that we saw, but now it's picked up and I anticipate that January is going to be up at that the average is going to be somewhere about 170. So it's going to lock back in on that curve, which is pretty cool. I mean, again, maybe you're starting to understand something, maybe not. I guess my peers will tell me when I'm not. So thank you, Bailey. So um, another one of my kids, I've got too many kids. So um, this is what's happened in the last couple of days, right? So this is the last seven days going back to January 5th. Um, interestingly enough, um, this is the X-ray flux. And so you'll see one, two, three X-ray X-class flares. So there's, there's not huge ones, 
but this is number two and number three so far uh, in terms of magnitude. So the first and sec uh, second and third strongest flares of the cycle so far. Um, uh, and uh, things are looking pretty rosy. Uh, a couple of weeks before that, the last rotation, there was an absolute multitude of M-class flares and probably out of these same longitudes. So clearly things have just stepped up a gear. Um, I'm assuming that your propagation is probably off the charts or getting there. Right. Um, I imagine things are lighting up. Um, one of my friends said there's a lot of trans equatorial stuff that's going on that's kind of interesting and cool. So, um, and this is uh, a new crypto plot that I'm going to introduce you to. Let's see if this works. All right. Who can see their backside? Can any of you see your own backside? Hmm. Nope. Okay, so there's this really wild um, analytic technique that was developed maybe 10 or 15 years ago. So even though we don't have observatories on the far side of the sun, we can use the seismic um, mod fluctuations in the surface of the sun to try and infer if there's activity on the back side of the sun, okay? So we won't go into how that works, but if you think about it, a, a wave kind of bounces, an acoustic wave bounces around the inside. What they basically do is look at the timing differences between the waves that they see on the front side and on the back side. And when they see a lag, it means that there's probably some big sunspot there or something that's slowing the waves down because the speed of sound changes when you've got magnetic field there. So it's, it's, it's very analogous to how geology works. So any of you working in geological exploration, um, this is totally old hat to you. But to see it applied to the sun and to a star is pretty cool. And so what you've got on the animation on the left-hand side is the, the sun-facing magnetic field is in gray, black and white. So black and white are the magnetic fields. And the yellow mishmash is the face of the sun that's facing away from us. And what you'll see is actually it's fairly, fairly bloody good. Right, it, it won't give you the magnitude, but it will tell you that there's something there. What I was trying to do when I made this was to make an animation over the last year so that you could see how this, this puzzle of, of longitude was starting to fill in. Um, maybe if I can get that movie, I'll post it on the, if I can finalize that movie, uh, I, can, I can post it on the, on the forum for you all to see, but it's pretty cool. So you see that out of the murk, these things start to arise. You can also see them slightly shifting. Remember how I said that they don't sit on the surface, so they rotate slightly differently, which means that they, they travel kind of past, um, past the observer. It's kind of all kind of cool. But the thing I really want to draw your attention to, and if any of you want to pull up an image of the EUV sun right now, this is from just yesterday. The, so the plot on the right-hand side. Can you see what I see? Just sitting behind the east limb of the sun. Right? These things are starting, to, these two big black regions. So in the upper hand, two big black regions. And the, and the lower panel, it's a pink region and a big blue one. What those basically mean is that that 200 is going to be surpassed really fast. Right? So the EUV flux and the radio flux are going to get pretty high in the next week, right? Probably more X flares means maybe some black hats. But one of the things that has been very interesting about the flares that the sun has produced over the last um, week, do you notice how spiky they are? They're really spiky. These are what we call impulsive flares, which means that they probably didn't have coronal mass ejections associated with them, which means that you know, the magnetics, magnetospheric disturbances are absolutely minimal, right? But these are very energetic things, but they're just, right? And eight minutes later, we feel it, right? So um, none of these have been producing big CMEs yet, but it's entirely possible that the, the two that are really lurking, um, maybe when I, I drop the presentation, I can go and show you what 
what's behind the limb. Um, but those look uh, truly scary. So going back to the the, the kind of old slide, you know, I can't help but think that we're we're piecing pulling evidence together to support this hypothesis that you know these halo cycles matter and that the sunspot cycle is shaped by them. Um, the Terminator is real. I'm really glad that we made that hypothesis, and I'm really, really double glad that it actually happened. I'm a bit pissed that it happened a year late, uh, but you know I can't control that. So um, growth has been balanced, uh, and it looks like we're probably at least in second and maybe in the third year. We have about a year to go <laughs> as things as things go. And I won't get into the stuff at the bottom about, you know, that's just poking the bear, really. Uh, that the, you know, these are these are zeroth order things that are wrong in the present theory. Right. Uh, the, the, um, and we'll maybe get to that. Maybe when Frank and I start to dance on the top of a Scottish house where we're completely liquored up, we can start to worry about those things. OK, that's at least a year and a half away from now, Frank, just just saying. Right. So uh, that's that for that. Let me see if I can uh, find a different tab uh, and share it. I get to share my browser. If it will allow me, where is it? Well, here it is. And show you that a lot of this stuff isn't, you know, some of it is bluster, but not all of it. So let's see. You can marvel at the solar cycle projection as per NOAA. Solar X-ray flux, so just, just checking to see if anything's happened in the last few hours. Let me see if I can find this. There's one I'm looking for. I'm going to have to search for it. All right. Apologies for the dead air. I can't type and talk at the same time. So here's a good, here's a very good source for you to look at these kinds of images. Where are they? Where's the beacon? Okay, so here is an image, one of the most latest peeking behind the sun, right? So stereo A, the sun and the earth are on this line, stereo A is sitting about here, it's a tiny little bit um, ahead of the sun earth line. And so it's peeking around the sun before things come to us. So remember how I was talking about those gargantuan active regions that are sitting there? The, the seismic technique picks up. This here on the limb is a lot of stuff, right? So that that 200, I, I wouldn't be shocked if we get up to 220, 230 by maybe by the end of next week. Right, provided that there's no blackouts associated with flares and things like that. So things are looking good. Could be some fun. So anyway, um, I will stop sharing my screen. Uh, realize that I probably put half of you to sleep and um, or at least half. That's my objective. Uh, if I can accomplish half, that's what we've been a key performance indicator, some bullshit that we deal with. So um, any questions, comments? Scott, you, you had in one of your slides, you said that the hemispheres were progressing pretty well together. Are you revising your prediction now that there might be a single large peak rather than a double peak? Um, good question, Lance. Um, it's really hard to tell. It looks like they're still pretty synchronized, right? So there, there is some asymmetry, but it's not huge. I guess over the next six months, we'll be able to tell. 
right? That um, I've been surprised at how symmetric the growth has been. Let me put it that way. They're not usually like that. So, but that that all tends towards a larger single peak, right? So, I get it. what I really wanted to do, and I shouldn't probably put this on a YouTube, but um, I really wanted to blow through that forecast, right? So the best way for it to blow through that forecast is to do it synchronized. If it becomes asynchronized, then it it quenches the amplitude. Right? It gets spread out for longer, but it pulls that maximum down. I've been very cynical, right? So that's a great question. I'm seeing a comment. It's just stuck in the chat, Paul. You know, I, I, so Peter's there. Hi, Peter. Um, I I talked about cycle twenty six. We can actually see cycle twenty six. We'll see it. Yeah, I was I was wondering if you hinted at that about uh, twenty minutes ago when you were talking. Um, and you're saying like maybe eighteen months. So I guess you're talking about we're peaking, and then we'll start to see twenty six. Is that? We'll sort of start annoying. to see it at very high latitudes. So it's like yeah. a trail. It's like a tra it starts off like a trail of breadcrumbs. But these um, little objects that we are measuring are sensitive to that. So they start. We start to see more density at high latitudes, and then it, it gets stronger. It gets more and more pronounced with time, right? So you just seen the first little tendrils of it. Now, are you the first to see this, or is this something you're confirming others have seen before? No, I, I think we're the first people to really describe it. You can see it in, in other measures. You know, there's a lots of other ways of visualizing this stuff, but the problem is that um, really nobody's put two and two together to make four, right? Yeah. We've only put two and two together to make three or six or eight, right? So it's it's... And, and like I said, there's there's a lot of there's a healthy amount of skepticism that you know the 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 big thing they were saying to us, oh, you're not actually measuring the magnetic field, so that can't be true. But now we've showed them that they were measuring the magnetic field. So, well, are 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 you measuring, or is the instrumentation measuring kind of the depth into the sun, say relative to the photosphere? Is it, it is it a depth thing that we're looking at? Could could the different hemispheres be actually one is deeper in the magnetic field than the other? It, it it's possible, but it's that's not quite the way it works. But it's possible. It, you're you're seeing there's some kind of weird effect. I mean, it's all thermal at some level, right? And mm. so, but this stuff. So if I if I pop this back up again, um, remember how I said that the what? Can you see that? Yeah. So the polar coronal holes are gone, right? So do you see that line? So can you see my cursor? Can you see my yeah. dragon cursor? So there's a line sitting up at the polar cap. Yeah. Right? There's one in each hemisphere. Yeah, you can see a southern one too. Those are sitting at 55 degrees latitude, right? The mystery latitude. Why the hell does that happen? Right? And, and the polar coronal holes are gone which means that we're in this polar reversal process. So solar maximum is no more than a year away, mm -hmm. right? So it's, you know, so this forecast isn't just going to blow out on amplitude. It's blown out on time as well, right? So so there, there's a multitude of things going on, but literally over the last six weeks, we've seen a massive amount of growth in, in longitude. And I, I, you know, a lot of my colleagues, and this is one going to be one of my points in my talk tomorrow that I'm going to try and stay up and write, um, is that the sun isn't flat, right? It's a rotating object, and rotating objects do shit like this, yeah, right. Whether it's a planetary atmosphere, or 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 whatever whatever you want, if you've got a rotating ocean, if you just had a a planet with an ocean on it, it would experience yeah. the same behavior. So, yeah, the different, levels guys. Of mo different momentum as well. Exactly. Hey, hey Scott. Well, yeah, go ahead. Uh, on your talk tomorrow, remember Euripides played the Cyclops 
And the problem that the Cyclops had was he had one eye. He had no perspective. There's your lead in for why you need to look at the poles because it's not flat. We're being Cyclops if we don't do it. Mate, I'll, I'll remember that. I've got, I've got some Livingston and Stanley things to throw up as well, Frank. So I've got, I've got a whole multitude of here's a lot of things we don't do. Right. So it's, I'm going to start off with, you know, we've never tracked a single active region all the way around the sun ever. Ever. We have, we have no idea of the time history of these objects. None. Zero. It's never been done. Right. And, and it's critical, actually. How, how do you know for a given magnetic configuration, how many flares that this thing's going to produce as a function of its lifetime? Right. You, you, there's no there's no botany right there's not there there's no zoology or nothing it's all guesswork some of it's educated guesswork some of it hey scott this is is this the picture of the back of the sun or is this the front of the sun this is not the sun's back side this is the back side so oh this is really the front funny. this is the front i love calling it the back side we should call it the far side really but the, the, this <clears> is the front this is the front. So is it rotating from the right side to the left? It goes that way. So that this is be, so yeah. it's backwards relative to us. So the bit on the left is the east side. I so know that. Oh, uh, I see. So it's going from east to west, from the left to the right. Astronomical convention. <laughs> Just turn yeah. it upside down. <laughs> yeah, turn it upside down. <laughs> so, so yeah, so all of that, all of that stuff that's appearing on the left side of the image is the stuff that the seismology was showing up, Paul. Yeah. Right, it's showing up that there's huge magnetic fields there. Yeah, so that's like a sunrise. We, 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 yeah, exactly, coming over the horizon. Yeah, it's actually very impressive. So, I don't know if any of you ever saw the movie um, Solar Max. That was it was an IMAX movie that ran at all the big uh, history museums. They basically took this movie and rotated it on its side, and they had these huge, like big bits of broccoli coming out over the top. If I if I can find one of those movies, I'll I'll post a link to it somewhere. It's incredible <laughs> in HD. It's absolutely staggering. So yeah, so that's that's the sun as it is kind of right now. So that yeah. that's that those active regions on the the lower, so that the two that are sitting at about the same longitude, um, about fifty degrees back from the equator, uh, from the central meridian, seem to be highly coupled. They're they're the two that the X class flares are coming from. So um, and it looks like that one that's kind of popping off behind the limb is also going to be. <laughs> So, right. pretty cool. It's it my happened. imagination, but is there is there like a flare coming out on the around? Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, about two hundred and forty degrees. Yeah, it looks like it. <laughs> yeah, there's probably a, a small filament eruption. So that so the fact that it's kind of uh, it's almost like a Kelvin Helmholtz instability, right? So that you, the fact that it's rugged, if you look at that shape that's protruding out means that there's really cold material that's been shot out. So yeah, it's a flare in a CME, probably not, probably C-class. But it, where, the, where the sun is right now, C-class is kind of in the noise. Yeah. <laughs> which is kind of amazing as well, right? Well, yeah, you know, here I go if a C-class flare would be cheering. <clears throat> yeah, Scott, I don't want to keep you too much longer because I know you've got some family and you got to write a presentation. Uh, any other questions, guys, because we want to, I want to get all the questions out of here. And yeah, a lot of guys on here, so we should be able to get some good questions. Yeah, is this is this actually the photosphere we're looking at in a, some false color? No, Peter. That's this is the <clears throat> extreme ultraviolet corona. That's so like you're looking at plasma that's about a million degrees, a million. Okay, and a half. so we're above the photosphere. Yeah, we're it's in, above. Yeah, it's above. Yeah, yeah that's I why there were no. Uh, uh, <clears throat> Um, you know, uh, coronal, you know, big loops and so on, right? There is a different level above the above the photosphere. <clears throat> correct, correct. Yeah. So if I, I could pull up the 
I'm a glutton for punishment, Paul. Don't worry about my time. <laughs> um, so here's here's another nice resource where you can go and look at this stuff, right? So this is the Solar Dynamics Observatory. So this is the thing that I was the coffee boy for. Yeah. Right? So you can look. So there's the continuum. There's ah, that. Look at that. It's a smiley face. <clears throat> um. So you can look at the continuum image. So this is, there you go, that's the photosphere, right? Yeah, yeah. Look at some of those bad boys. I'm, I'm intrigued. So stereo is about a day ahead, right? So about this time tomorrow, we'll start to see those sunspots just popping over the limb. So. <clears throat> So yeah, I know this is a really nice resource if you want to go look at look at this thing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so also, um, Scott, the last time we talked, we were uh, discussing a little bit about um, you know the radionuclei being uh, modulated by uh, the uh, the solar wind, and yep. uh, we were talking about use of ice cores. You were going to check with one of, some of your colleagues in uh, in Hanover, I think. Uh, did yeah, you do that, no. and did they provide you with any evidence? Because I'd been compiling some stuff for you that I could send to you maybe tomorrow if you're interested. Oh no, I'd absolutely be interested. No, they they um, invited me over. I just haven't been yet. They want they don't they want to talk about it in person. So I can only mean that. Guess that. Oh, means okay. It, that means well, then I'll, I'll give you. I'll send you a whole bunch of uh, reference material that uh, you can use as uh, preparation for that meeting then. <laughs> Thank you, because that's that's one of the things is um, I'm really fascinated with kind of archaeology of this stuff, right? Yeah, well, so there's certainly a lot of data from a number of papers from both po polar regions, uh, primarily Greenland and, and uh, Antarctica, where there are uh, data from ice cores to measure various um, radionuclides well, and, and I'm related them to solar flux. What I'm really wondering if we can see, uh, as you saw in the cosmic rays, the signature of these Terminator events is actually pretty, it's pretty clear. It's not great, but it's there. We could go through those ice core samples as long as we, if that's, if that's what we're looking for. So the, the problem is when they've done these studies, um, they've not been looking for that before, mm -hmm. right? And, and so what happens is, you know, human nature is human nature. You don't, you can't explain it, so you throw it out. So what I was trying to convince them to do is to go back and look at the data with a new set of eyes, right? Or, or give me the data and I'll analyze it the way we look at it, and we'll con we'll compare notes, right? Sure. Do I, well, what I've done so far is I've been going through the literature and mm -hmm. compiling the the reference papers and then the references in those papers as well that deal with the the topic that we were talking about. So well, I mean, yeah, I don't anything... want to talk more more of your time either. So great. Oh, if anything comes out of it, you get to be a co-author in this damn monstrosity, Peter, okay? <laughs> oh, that's a possibility. All right, so we'll, I'll let you know. I'm probably going to go in March or April sometime, so. Okay, well, I'll send you something in the next few days. Thanks, man. I appreciate Maybe it. Maybe we can iterate Frank. on it. Thank you. Hey, Scott, this is Frank, W3LPL. Just hey, in Frank. case there's anybody on here interested in six meters. Anybody here interested in six meters? The, the magic solar flux index for six meters is about 220 to 230. Uh -huh. You're getting better. Better. So it sounds like uh, from your uh, recent observations that it's possible that we'll see numbers like that uh, starting over the next week. Um, and then, of course, there's a big seasonal effect. So after about March 1st, it doesn't shut matter down. very much anymore. From yeah. a, a F2 propagation point of view. But between now and March 1st, when we see these solar flux indices above 220, it's time to really pay attention. And then uh, we can go asleep again until about uh, the end of October. <laughs> Unless, yeah, I mean, things have to get truly crazy, right, Frank? Yeah, well, we're looking forward to it. Uh, Rich is on here, K1HTV, and he shared with me his. Uh, six meter logs for the last uh, couple of solar cycles. And this trend that I just mentioned is very, very apparent in his logs. Huh? How many QSOs do you have in that log, Rich? Uh, 9,900 uh, that are non-USA. <laughs> That's pretty good statistics, Rich. 
Yeah. And unfortunately, I was working evening shift uh, at the Voice of America for uh, a couple of those cycles. And I missed the the late afternoon, early evening. So the JAs and I did on the weekend work some V7s and KG6 and a, and a JA or so. But uh, most of that I, I I was working. So I missed some of the but now I'm retired and I'm going to be ready for it. I got no the, excuses. Yeah, I'm all oh, ready to go uh, so with a with a bit pop this, this, uh, pair of sevens and a bit pop. So Scott has got our interest, and we're going to have to be paying attention over the next two months, and then we can go to sleep for about six months. <laughs> well, then there's sporadic E and other stuff, but uh, oh, but you know, uh, when it comes back, it should be perpetually there, Frank. Yeah, but right. uh, the seasonal effect will uh, pretty much when it comes back in the fall. Years, when it comes back in the fall, you should be way up there. Oh yeah, late October we'll be uh, we'll be awake again. <laughs> And Lance will be somewhere. Peter, your yeah. hands up again. You okay? Yeah, I, I just wanted to know, Scott, if you know why uh, Art Covington chose 10.7 centimeters. I have no idea. Do you know what that's measuring in terms of depth then from some relative surface? Where is oh. that 10.7 coming <clears throat> from? So it comes from two places, right? So there's a photospheric component of it. So, um, kind of thermal bremsstrahlung, right? The background. And then there's the coronal kind of synchrotron radiation. Right. So it's I, I guess it's at that million to two million degree synchrotron range. Mm -hmm. So that that's actually one of the things that really confuses people with 10.7 is that it's not a singular contribution. Yeah. So yeah I don't know but it's a beautiful measurement. I've be, I've been there. It's kind of cool. Yeah, well, it's the longest running record, too. Yeah, no, yeah. Um, that and the green line until he decided to turn the green line off. So I was, I'm trying to resurrect a lot of these things. So it's um, slow and painful. We've got, I, I don't uh, know how many of the um, the folks on the on this uh, link are uh, aware, of, especially the Canadians who are here, see a few VEs, uh, that Art Covington, actually, the guy who started the 10.7 was a Canadian uh, uh, astronomer working at the National Research Council. Yeah, Pentington. I never quite pronounce it properly. By the Dominion Radio Observatory, as it is known now. So, yeah, Dominion Radio Astrophysical Observatory, I think they call it. Yep. I I check it out once a month, unless I get compelled to do it otherwise. So, is Ken Tapping still uh, running that? Yeah. His health fluctuates, but he's a fun guy to talk to. Yes. Uh, not a mushroom, a real fun guy. <laughs> Bad <laughs> joke. Sorry. <clears throat> Lance, you're going to be, you're gonna be operating DX this, uh, this uh, fall? I, I'm planning on, uh, on mid-September to early October to be in some mystery location. Okay, so hopefully we'll have lots of solar flux. To bounce Did you off. give away your mystery location the last time we talked? Uh, the mystery location last time we talked was uh, was Mayotte, uh, east of Africa, okay. and it provided provided lots of TEP. And but I, you know, we had all this geophys geo uh, magnetic disturbances during that, which really really hurt me on EME. I only worked a hundred different stations on EME from from uh, down in Mayotte. So I'm hoping that uh, next fall it'll be pretty good. And, you know, I, I'm not trying to keep it a mystery, but, I, I, but I'm still working on these spots. But the two spots I'm looking at have never been contacted on six meters from the United States. So people should be interested to work me, I think. Cool. I wasn't trying to call you out. Hey, Lance, my guess is that we're going to be working you more on TEP than EME on that trip. I I, I hope so. I hope so. That would be great. Well, and, and there's one thing to be, only a one wee thing to be worried about. Geomagnetic activity actually peaks about a year after sunspots peak. So you know it's gonna it's only going to get progressively worse for a couple of years and then before it starts to tail off again. So 
if 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 things follow the normal pattern. But you know, we're in the process of breaking shit right now, so all good. But good uh, luck. Scott, somebody yep. uh, post uh, Bill uh, Miller posted on the chat mm. the uh, history of uh, the ten point seven. That's cool. Yeah, yeah I mean. Yeah. They, yeah, he says it was because they used surplus uh, radar gear. Yes, it was surplus stuff. Yeah, World War One, World War Two stuff. So that's how he picked the frequencies. What they had. Well, in fact, that's how that's how glaciologists started using radar to sound ice sheets. Yeah. Because during the um, period of the Second World War, where they were building aircraft in North America and shipping them to uh, Britain, they would fly them over Greenland. And in the early days of uh, radar, they discovered the airplanes were crashing over Greenland. And the reason was the, ice, the radar was seen through the ice. Oh, and wow. so after the war, <laughs> they all just put the radar back on, instead of looking uh, uh, up or into the air, they turned it looking through ice. And that's how we started mapping the, uh, the, the ice sheets. It's a, kind of, kind of bad day for them, huh? And it was the same <laughs> stuff for, you know, old, old, it was ex-military equipment. Right. It's amazing. It's amazing how technology, I mean, the, I, I kind of read a lot of these books. Uh, it's amazing how quickly the technology advanced in the, the, the early, you know, the late 30s and early 40s, all this stuff is incredible. You know, um, so yeah, I'm, I, I try to follow some of that stuff. Very fascinating. Um, one, of the, one of the things I looked at actually was um, the, not, not that, that, it's it's hard to track some of it, but everywhere that the Germans went, they set up chronographs, right? So they were interested in they knew about um, radio ionos you know ionospheric disturbances, and when they saw things coming off the sun, right, <laughs> they had a correlation that things would come off the sun and the radio would go out. Mm -hmm. So where wherever they annexed. He would go to the tallest peak and set up a chronograph. And it was a, a very famous uh, German solar physicist called Kiepenheuer that was in charge of that. And he has his own institute in Freiburg. If any of you are fortunate enough to go to the Black Forest, um, Freiburg's a beautiful little town there. And the Kiepenheuer Institute's there. It's uh, something to go and see. So, so anyway. Very good. And uh, Scott, we really appreciate all your time tonight and uh, also appreciate your, uh, your your kids giving you the time to do this. <laughs> I'm um, going to I'm going to deal with them shortly, Paul. Yeah, well, they're, they're probably asleep by now. <laughs> no, no, they're, they're still floating around. I can hear them. So all right. how many kids you got against? Is it seven? Too many. Too many. <laughs> Maybe more. I've, I've got five. Uh, and he's spanned between um, five years old and 19. Good. Well, that sounds great. Well, listen, th thanks again for everything. And uh, I'll be back to buggy again probably in a few months. And and uh, we could talk about what happened. And Lance can tell us about his secret spot. He's going to be uh, in the world this, uh, this fall. So we always have lots of news here on the front range. I'll be, I'll be putting this on to uh, YouTube uh, uh, hopefully tomorrow if I get a second. And uh, you guys can see this all over again, uh, deja vu. And um, we'll uh, we'll see what we can do. I, I don't know if there's going to be another. It won't be another uh, Zoom this month because I'm going to be out of, out of the country. But uh, we'll hopefully have some interesting ones in February. I'll take care, everyone, and I'll try and develop some new material for next time we talk. Okay. Take care. Thanks, Good luck. Happy Thanks, hunting. Scott. Thank you so much. Fascinating. Thank you very much, Thanks, Scott. Scott. Thanks, Thanks, Scott. Scott. Cheers, guys. See y'all. Catch tomorrow, Scott. Cheers. 73. 73.